longtime friend, the Carl Young, some people say, of psychologists in the real estate investing and wholesaling space, has a few psychology degrees, which I absolutely love. Um, Rafael Cortez, man, good to be good to be chatting with you and even better to be hanging out um, last month in Tampa. Oh, man, it was a blast. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. Appreciate it. It's an honor. A, a pleasure and a privilege. The very first event I went to for Investor Fuse was, I, I believe it was 2016, and it was a Sean Terry conference. And that was the first time that I got um, mm-hmm. exposed to who you were and everything like that when you spoke about the different seller personality types, which we're going to talk about today just to get an understanding. But the first time I saw you speak there when I was just working as a, you know, like pretty much like selling, inv- like had a table for investor fees and everything like that. And it's funny because like yeah. Nick Perry and a lot of people there that I met that had investor fees accounts. That's the, la- the first time I met a lot of them there at that event, including <laughs> you. That, uh, that weekend was insane. I mean, there was so many people in that conference that, that, I mean, that weekend specifically that just branched out doing, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, uh, you know, batch, uh, was, was there that many of you were there. Yeah. Moments. Yeah. They, I mean, they blew up, um, Nick Perry was, I mean, there was a whole bunch of, you know, people over, over the, um, over the weekend over there. And it was just amazing. It's crazy to see fast forward, you know, a few years and all these people are crushing it. So. Mm-hmm. Fast yeah. forward like five years, but yeah, I, I, I left that, you know, you were one of the many people that I was super impressed with just getting to see how they move and operate from just being a wholesaler locally in Baltimore to pretty much working as a consultant full-time doing investor views and seeing companies all across the country. So I was like, man, this guy, Rafael, I, I got to go introduce myself and talk to this guy, of course, was, was really, really kind and nice and have got to connect, you know, stay in touch digitally. Um, and then meet a couple times up in person, like we were just at an event. And I went to your and Brent and Batch's office at the end of 2019 when I was out there for a mastermind. So very big fan of Raphael's and he's now coaching with Wholesaling Inc. as well, which we have all the Wholesaling Inc. coaches on. Amazing program there that's helped out thousands and thousands of investors and just and most importantly, are really good people. So very happy to have you on, man, and always good to be chatting with you. Cool. No, thanks for the invite, man. Again, I appreciate it. Yeah. So give a give an update, man, before we talk about, you know, Sean Terry days and working with him and working out of the same office with the batch people and Brent, which are just amazing, super smart people in this space. Um, what is everything that you have going on now? I mentioned the coaching, you got an active real estate business. Give us a snapshot of that. So I've always had uh, multiple things running at once, even back then when I was uh, doing acquisitions and, and, um, and when we met back in 2000, uh, real estate. Uh, so now I have, I own a brokerage. I'm in Maricopa County, which is Phoenix. I'm in the Phoenix market primarily. I do um, um, marketing throughout the U.S. and whatnot, but our backbone market is it's still Maricopa County. And uh, I own a brokerage here. Um, then I have my wholesale business, which uh, we cherry pick and then do fix and flip, that sort of thing, right? Um, and uh, I'm also an organizational psychologist, which uh, it's business psychology, and I have my practice through uh, CEO polls. But uh, yeah, between those three businesses, I mean, I stay, I stay pretty busy, uh, pretty consistent. Then I have my education uh, programs, which are focused on on real estate wholesaling. That's the wholesaling business blueprint. But yeah, I have a couple of projects going on, uh, usually at all times. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. And just just for the personal side as well, living in the Phoenix area, <laughs> wife, right. kids. I believe the the oldest son of yours almost made you shed a tear because he started getting interested in learning about wholesaling. He oh, also he's... is about your size now and can re- can wrestle you around a good bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. He's, he actually jo- uh, joined the wrestling team, but uh, he started cold calling over the summer. He's 14 years old. And he, he walks up, he's like, Hey dad, how can I be your student? And, and I mean, I try to play it cool. Honestly, I try to like, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. You have to go through this process and, and then, I mean, you got to be, you know, make sure that you're worthy and, and, and you're going to put in the effort and do, you know, so I was trying, you know, I was doing, you know, kind of rolling in my own BS there for a little bit, but on the inside, man, I just wanted to scream and cry. I was like, yes, <laughs> my kid wants to listen to what I got to say. That's amazing. Uh, but no, it was a pretty cool um, uh, moment. So he went, he actually went through all my training, um, the, uh, the online, pro, uh, you know, program and, and did the setup. So he runs his own little, uh, wholesaling operation now. Like he's actually cold calling, going into it and he's 14 years old, man. And I'm so proud of, so proud of that kid. It's just insane. 
Yeah, dude, that's that's amazing. And I know a couple guys just off the top of my head, Phil Shaw, who's in our mastermind, and Noah Altavaro. They're both in Florida, actually, but they brought on their sons that I want to say are like 18 to 21 range that are acquisitions managers for them now. So they're actually doing like driving for dollars, cold calling the list. So they're it's amazing to see even a 14 year old, like a freshman in high school is doing that with his summer instead of doing what was I doing, getting ready for high school soccer team and God knows what. But that that's amazing when you were telling me that a couple months ago. Well, it, it does. It does a couple of things, right? I mean, I'm, I, I focus a lot on the mindset. And one thing that I've seen, for example, he's he's uh, and I'll use him as an uh, just a as a, a case study, right? But he's he's a very big introvert, so he's he's you know the quiet type. He keeps to himself. He's and then doing stuff like this, exposing himself to like the whole process of building his own business at 14 years old, and then going through the uh, rejection and all the challenges and all that stuff that you get when you cold call. Uh, it's mm-hmm. really just giving him that much more confidence, um, and I see it. Like I see it in him, which is, I mean, honestly, it's one of the biggest, coolest things that, you know, can happen. You just, you just get rewired as you start going through the, uh, you know, through this process, especially if you do it at a young age, like mm-hmm. these 14, 15, 16, 17, I have, um, I have students, 18 year old students uh, that go through the process and the, you know, they lock up their deal, their first deal. And, and it's just, I mean, you see the, you see the mm-hmm. click immediately. It's just rewiring of, of uh, the whole belief and the thought process. So mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah, man. Absolutely. Well, let's dive a little bit into your, your background. I think that molds a lot of what you have going on today. But how did you get into real estate already? We've already done some foreshadowing of working with Sean Terry. That's how I learned wholesaling pretty much just through his, his podcast and free resources nope. there <laughs> in uh, end of 2013 into 2014. So yeah, we'd love to hear this. And I know that you're a serial entrepreneur bought and sold businesses. So you have an awesome story and background. Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate you uh, putting that out there. And um, so I I became a fireman when I was 19 years old. And through that process, through the firefighter years, I I, I figured, I mean, we had 24 on, 24 off uh, on shifts, right? And then we had like a, you know, four or five days that were completely off. So there was a lot of time there. And like, we can do something, we can do something. Uh, My captain and I sat down one day and, and we just started kind of brainstorming on on a few ideas and and I ended up building a non-emergency medical transportation business, which is an ambulance um, um, company. So I launched that when I was 20, 21, really kind of picked up traction when I turned 23. And that's when I got my first paid client and whatnot. I was still in the fire department at this time, uh, but I ran that. I had that for, I sold that in 2014. Um, and when I launched, uh, it was early 2007. Um, so I had it for, for just, just about eight years. Um, and during that time I started looking at other stuff, right? So I built the the company out, I bought one vehicle and bootstrapped the whole thing and whatnot. Um, but I, I started getting more vehicles in more people in. eventually built that, built out a fleet. And I I had a, a, a bunch of, I mean, I had a lot of employees, um, and then I figured I wanted to do something that, uh, that wasn't you know, drawing up all my energy and my time. It's just, it was a lot of people to deal with and, and not particularly the model that I wanted to operate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started doing a, you know, fix and flip in the, in the meantime, cause I had some cash I was sitting on and, and eventually I, I, um, the first couple of uh, properties that I flipped, I mean, uh, I, I'm lucky to say that I didn't really lose uh, on, on him. Right. I that like either broke even or made a thousand. I think on the first three properties, uh, like the total tally you know, profits were like 2,500 bucks or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it was just like barely made it. Um, but I got the, uh, I got the bug and then I, you know, I, I, I started looking, I started getting properties on email list. I didn't know what wholesaling was, you know, at that point, I just, you know, knew how to swing a hammer. Because uh, I had worked construction throughout my high school years and in college and whatnot, so um, I I came up, I, I started buying properties from these people who sent send them to me via emails, right? Like, and then I figured out, you know, the on the settlement statement, you would see this big amount, you know, this assignment fee. Like, how is this guy making ten, fifteen thousand dollars on this property, mm-hmm. and I got to flip it, and I only made ten, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and or you know, made the same or maybe just a little more and whatnot. Anyways, I got into it. Eventually I, I, um, I, I came up, you know, I figured out, I sat down with one of these guys and he goes, yeah, man, we just go direct to seller. We look for properties. And he just kind of gave me the skinny. 
Um, and I started looking uh, up information about it and um, came up, um, across uh, Sean. Uh, he was, uh, well, actually, Todd Toback was the first one I, I heard in wholesaling. Uh, and then Todd Toback had Sean Terry uh, on, I think, third or fourth episode or something like that. But Sean was out of Maricopa County. So I was in Maricopa County and then uh, found Sean and started listening to him. And I closed a couple of wholesale deals like that. And I, I got into his email list. So it came down to the point where I sold, you know, I got ready to sell the property. Or I'm sorry, sell my business, the transportation business. And I decided I want to go all into real estate. Uh, he like along those, uh, that time frame, he sent out an email looking for an acquisitions guy. And I was like, well, I mean, I haven't worked for anybody in the last, you know, 10 years. So, but I mean, if I, if I'm going to get exposed and go to a company, that's not mine, like it's, I want to get challenged. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, so I sent in a video, you know, there was a lot of people who applied and whatnot. And, and I ended up making the cut, stay there for, for the next, uh, just about three years with them. So, I mean, it was a, a uh, like a big, big, big learning experience because that was at the, uh, you know, end of uh, all that marketing that was going on, uh, of the seller appointments. At this time, I, I got back into, um, um, I was going to uh, university and working my degrees for uh, psych- organizational psychology and doing a lot of things, you know, along those lines, but I sold the original business. So all I was, you know, eating and drinking and dreaming about was real estate mostly. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Very cool. I mean, yeah, you started a business, you bootstrapped a business yeah. at a young age. So I'm not, I'm not surprised the apple doesn't far, fall too far from the tree there with your son and it, you know, oh. an introvert already doing cold calling and stuff like that. What was it like working with Sean out of the gate and how much were you able to apply what you were learning with psychology, which I know this is a little bit of a rhetorical question or an implied question here, but like, what was it like working with Sean as far as what you were doing? You mentioned acquisitions manager, while you're also finishing up degree, what was that like? I mean, I can tell you uh, that it cut my learning curve for, you know, 10, 15 years, Mm -hmm. Um, just because of the amount of exposure that I was getting. And, uh, and it was really, it was a really cool time period. I mean, I was putting a lot of work in, right, going to, Mm -hmm. to school and then learning the the theoretical aspect of human behavior and, and and business, the ins and outs and all that stuff. Um, I I had my bachelor's in in, um, business management, and then I got, um, a, a master's in psychology. Then I jumped into that second master's degree for organizational psychology. So it just kind of tied everything together. And I was exposed um, to um, to seller appointments. So every single time, I mean, we'd go through, I mean, some something theoretical that you read in a book at university and then see it um, the next day when you're sitting across the, uh, across the table from my seller. I mean, it, that's, that's gold right there. Um, and I was going on average, you know, five, six appointments a day you know, face-to-face appointments, uh, Monday to Friday, Saturdays too, I mean, sometimes. And and so the exposure level was just there, like putting in the reps. I think that was the mm-hmm. biggest thing. So it was, um, it was a very, you know, trial by fire type of experience. Um, and I mean, totally, totally worth it. I do it all over mm-hmm. again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one thing I think that you could probably hit on hit on briefly of someone starting their own wholesaling or really a direct to seller marketing company doing all the appointments versus joining someone potentially as like an acquisitions or a lead manager, getting a ton of experience, not necessarily in some situations have to worry about a burn rate with you putting up your own dollars for marketing versus yeah. someone just putting you onto appointments and getting a cut of the closed deals. Um, man, it's, it's one of the biggest challenges that I see, uh, especially with, with students, you have to find a way to cut the learning curve right now. The market's moving so fast. Competition is, I mean, it's, it's vicious out there. Uh, any market that you tap into, there's going to be somebody else or, you know, a bunch of other people doing, you know, trying to wholesale and do this, do the same thing. The, the barrier to entry is low. Uh, when you're talking about wholesaling. Okay. Uh, it's not easy. It's not one of those uh, industries where you, I mean, you come in and then you can uh, just thrive, you know, for sure, uh, you know, two, three months into it. Uh, some people take, you know, eight, nine, 10 months to get a first deal through the door, but that's because of the learning curve. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, uh, then what happens, there's a lot of rejection. Uh, I mean, when you, when you're calling, when you're reaching out to people, you're, you, you're, we're looking for a very specific uh, sector of the population who wants to sell. Okay. So it's a very small amount group of people who are actually going to be the right person for us to do business with. And, and what that means is that most people are going to be saying no most, and then people get just, 
you know, emotionally battered with rejection and no's and all that stuff. And the, 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 uh, the consistency starts dropping. So um, the reason I'm saying all of this is, is because it's something, it's one thing to consider, find a way to cut the learning curve, either go work for somebody uh, that already has a running business and that's, you know, willing to take you under the wing, coach you. Uh, and it's going to be in their best interest too, because if you're in acquisitions and trying to lock deals, like that's how they make the revenue, but they're going to walk you through the process. Right. And then um, more importantly, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to hold you accountable uh, for long enough that you start building habits. That's the biggest thing. You got to build habits. You got to build a habit of having conversations out there and being, you know, not necessarily being um, um, pretentious or, or, you know, in the sense of outgoing or anything like that. It's just, you know, building the habit of, of consistently reaching out to people, follow-ups and, and that sort of stuff. So as you're coming into it, if you're a solopreneur, um, and you're building up the, the company without any guidance, you're going to you go to YouTube university and you're trying to learn everything through videos and, and, you know, the process, um, all the pieces are going to be there. Right. But the order of things is not the order of things is going to be off. So I think that's where a lot of the confusion, you know, takes place and people have to worry about, okay, do I get, do I register an LLC? Do I do this? Do I do that? What do I do with accounting? Uh, how do I set up my systems? How do I, what do I use to blast this out? How do I have the conversations? How do I negotiate? How to run comps? How do I do this? I mean, there's so many different things that play into it mm -hmm. that you can bypass all that noise. If you go uh, cut the learning curve uh, somehow, either go work for somebody or, and I'm biased about this, but uh, you know, go, you know, pay for somebody to teach you what they know. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really, it's not an expense. It's, it's an investment. It's either on time or, or money, one of the two, but if you want to, if you want to be successful, you, you can't, um, um, the industry moves too fast. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To be able to catch up, uh, mm -hmm. like people could 10 years ago or like, it's not more PPC, um, you know, all that stuff. It's, it's was rolling out and people could take a little bit more time understanding it. Now you can't. Why? Because algorithms change all the time. Uh, hell, I think last year we had um, ringless voicemail. That was the thing, right? I mean, that lasted, what, a whole 10 months uh, before it got super red flagged and, and you know, just got complicated to do. Same thing, you know, SMS. So the, uh, the ways of marketing, finding sellers moves fast. You just have to be fast enough, mm -hmm. um, you know, to stick to it. 100% agree. And this may be spoken most most directly at least this portion to people that are at zero deals maybe like zero to one or zero to five deals as far as cutting the right. learning curve 100 100 agree on not only cutting the learning learning curve but staying on top of trends a lot of people pay all these money into masterminds 25k 15k 30k plus a year essentially just to stay on top of trends and things like that for my own, per, for a, a glance into my own personal life and kind of like limiting mindset versus abundant mindset, I'm looking to join a uh, this one guy that's starting like a crypto NFT blockchain mastermind. Part of the reason I don't know the price tag on it yet, but part of the reason I'm most likely going to be willing to pay an uncomfortable amount for me is because I know that I don't want to delegate a lot of time into learning NFTs and crypto. I just started buying crypto in the last year and it just sits there passively. But I don't want to go down a rabbit hole of learning all this stuff. I'd rather pay somebody for exactly what Raphael is saying. And then I can just put money into other crypto coins and NFTs and things of that nature and still focus on my one main thing. So I 100% agree and echo what Raphael said as far as just cutting the learning curve drastically. That mixed with also kind of the psychological aspect, what I said before of not worrying about the burn rate for your own marketing. Like I think that's going to put a little bit of a pressure, whether how much you consciously realize or not. But I think both of those together are, are absolutely huge in deciding if you want to start this up by yourself or potentially work and handle a segment of leads for somebody that's already established is a good person that you vetted out to some degree and is actually doing transactions in your you know local or I guess virtual market, especially with how things are set up on Zoom right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree, man, 100%. You just got to, you have to dig the trench uh, somehow, some way. Uh, there's just no way around it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to hear a little bit because the first exposure I got to you was talking about the different seller personality types. I'd love somewhat of a quick overview of the different seller personality types that you presented on back in the day. And of course, give an update to 
how, if at all, they have changed since then and how you're applying it in your own business, working with sellers and with all your students with Wholesaling Inc. and everything? Um, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so the uh, personality types, right? It, it's, it can be one of those things that sounds very, very confusing, but it's actually fairly simple. Uh, to um, to kind of categorize, so you don't have to have a a, a you, you don't have to be a psychologist to understand you know human communication, right? We pick that uh, through instinct. We pick that up through instinct, uh, intuition. We have context in conversations, and and um, you know when you walk into a room and you know if you you feel if you're vibing with somebody. Um, what's happening? It's not you're reading their mind. What's happening is that your subconscious is reading their body language. Uh, and you're reading, you know, what they, what they're presenting, you know, to you, a, a simple, uh, closing gesture on, you know, with, uh, in body language can tell you a lot, right. When you're having a conversation with somebody and it's, it's about understanding where to pick up those little, um, uh, those little nuggets, uh, and read between the lines. Now, one thing that I started doing very early on, and I think it was, it was the reason why I, I uh, my closing ratio was, was pretty high. Uh, it still is. And, and that's, that's it. It's just understanding uh, communication. Um, and what I mean by that, it, you know, a simple way to, to kind of frame it is going through the disc assessment. Uh, you know, people do disc for hiring and, and to understand what, uh, you know, how people are and whatnot. Um, I think going, you know, a few levels deeper and understanding how to read somebody, not necessarily by them taking the assessment, but by you looking at them, listening to how they're speaking um, and understanding their tonality, understanding, you know, what they're really saying in between the, the, the sentences um, is going to help you, you know, close a lot more deals. Why? Because every single person has a, a language, right? People are analytical, they're supportive, they're interactive, or they're drivers. Those are sort of the main four buckets for, for DISC. Um, and there's a lot of subcategories, there's a lot of sub behaviors, you know, behind or below those. But you don't need to understand all of that stuff just to have a good, solid conversation with somebody or understand how they communicate. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I have a, I have a really like small, uh, short PDF which I train uh, the uh, the cold call. My team, my whole team gets trained on on behavioral tendencies. Um, I can I can send that to you, and you get you can put it up if you want um, on the. Uh, a link. I'll send you a link to that. But Definitely. it's uh, basically what it is. It's, uh, for example, if you're talking to somebody who's a driver, right, they're going to be the tonality, it's going to be direct, they're usually concerned about going straight to the uh, to the bottom line. And, and they don't care much about building, you know, rapport or having a long conversation about, you know, what happened over the weekend and whatnot. Some people do need that high drivers. Mm -hmm. Um, usually don't. And the way that you recognize a high driver is uh, they're very dynamic when they speak. Um, they're very authoritative. You know, when, they, when they're speaking, they have almost an abrupt way of presenting things. Um, and, um, and when you're, so when you recognize a driver, like what you do is you actually mirror it. it it's, you mirror what they, uh, what there's not what they're saying, but the way they're saying things. So if you tend to be this quiet person that's more monotone and controlled and the demeanor is more laid back, you have to level up your game a little bit and then match them at the same frequency. What happens is that um, it's the fastest way to build rapport, one. OK, the fastest way to build rapport is not going to be, you know, talking about a football game, all, you know, for two hours. Uh, it's, it's not. It's going to be communicating with them in the way that they communicate uh, you know, to people. And if it's fast, if it's pace, you have to pick up your pace. Why? Because now they're you're both playing at the same, uh, you know, same uh, field. Mm -hmm. um, one thing one thing that I uh, and, and I say mirroring. Right. This is this is very interesting <clears throat> when you're building rapport. Uh, with somebody, people think that, oh, you know what, now I have a connection because they're telling me about their kids. I have a connection because they're telling me, you know, about what they used to like when they were, you know, little and whatnot. And some people just overshare. Some people just overshare. One thing that mm. you can count on for building rapport, though, is going to be body language. When somebody starts mirroring, meaning that uh, they start to mimic and uh, your body language, not you doing theirs, but they mimic yours subconsciously there's a connection attached so if you're just to kind of so you can kind of picture it if you're sitting at the uh, at the table at the dinner table with a seller and you're talking about you know the deal or negotiating the numbers and whatnot and you drop a number out there and you lean forward uh 
uh, and they lean forward with you, you still have them. Okay, so you're still they're still engaged in that conversation. Uh, but if you lean forward and they lean back, they're pushing back subconsciously from what you're saying. Okay, mm -hmm. so that, for example, that's the kind of stuff that I used to look for, and I still do uh, when I'm having a conversation with somebody. It's about communication, right? If uh, their body language is pulling away, um, I know that what I just said, I have to you know bring it back a little bit. So I can, you know, uh, have that conversation or um, I'm sorry, get get them engaged in that conversation again. Does that make sense? But when yeah. real rapport it, like a, an indication of real rapport is when they start mirroring you. Um, and uh, and you know, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I wanted to put out uh, put that out there uh, now. The next one is uh, interactives or influencers. Those people, you know, they're they're very vivid. They're very dynamic and they're going to they're going to move their their hands a lot. I'm, I'm a, my, my uh, behavioral profile is a DI. I'm a, I'm a driver um, influencer. So I, I speak loud. I'm dynamic. When I talk, I usually, sometimes people think I'm mad just because of my tonality and it's not, it's just the, uh, the, you know, the, the pace that I, that I move at. Um, and for somebody who's a high eye, it's, it's re uh, relationships. Uh, they're really good about, you know, just it's the type of person that you can put in a room and within five minutes, they're going to have 10 friends uh, or people that they've already spoken to and whatnot. So how do you speak to that uh, to that high eye uh, when you're in a seller's uh, conversation? You have to relate to them um, through uh, through experiences. Uh, they are the type of people that are going to you know need rapport, uh, building, not necessarily uh, super um focused on the bottom on the bottom line but they want to have that that connection between the two of you. Um, and you have to match that you have to match that so just uh, understand like when you're when you're speaking to a high eye one thing to kind of you know watch out for too is that uh, uh have you uh, have you ever been at a closing table with somebody who says yes let's get the deal done and then you feel like you have that you know relationship going and everything and then they just ghost you after that mm -hmm. yeah it's probably high eye Mm -hmm. um, a high driver will tell you, you know what? Never mind. It changed my my mind. Uh, don't call me again. And boom, they'll cut it off. Uh, usually, high eyes will will um, there's a there's a need for uh, for approval, right? So they won't mm -hmm. they won't um, they'll do anything to push away from rejection. And those are very long conversations that can lead nowhere. So it's important to to just kind of gauge which is which. Mm -hmm. um, then you have uh, steadies or supportives, right? Supportives usually uh, usually have to take it a lot slower, just because they need to have the emotional comfort to uh, to um, come to terms with the decision they're making. So it's a house, right? And that to them means that they're probably going to have to relocate. And uh, it, you know, if it's not an owner or absentee owner, uh, they're going to have to relocate. They're going to have to change. You know, something. You know, they, they're the type of people that are going to be concerned about the neighbors. What's going to happen to this house? Is it going to turn into a nice, pretty property that my neighbors can enjoy, or is it something that's going to be, you know, flipped and forgotten, or maybe left here until appreciation kicks in? Uh, so all of that stuff is going to matter to somebody who's a high S, a high D. A high driver is not going to give, uh, you know, uh, two craps about, you know, that kind of stuff. They just want the bottom line. Right. But mm -hmm. high S's is different. The, uh, the tonality, too, is a lot more monotone. Um, so what do you do? For example, in my case, I have to dial my 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 pace. I have to dial it down. Um, and not that I'm trying to overly explain anything. It's just getting on their level of communication. Um, if I'm too fast and if I say too many things at the same time or, you know, one right after another, it's not that they can't process it, but emotionally they're getting overwhelmed. Okay. So high S's get emotionally overwhelmed um, and they, they need their time to, to process through things like that. And then the, the, uh, the fourth one is analyticals uh, or calculating people, uh, calculate, calculating, compliant, analytical. I mean, it, it, it's all the same, but these are the type of sellers that you have to, you gotta, you gotta back up your comps. You gotta have data. You gotta have um, you know, information readily available because they are going to go through the, uh, through the whole breakdown of things. And what do you do? Like high drivers are not analytical. High eyes are not very analytical unless it's like a learned behavior or something. But uh, for the most part, um, we we don't we don't look at. I mean, we just want the bottom line and then like make a decision quick, right? Uh, high analyticals, no, they're gonna have to take you know their time, not because they need to come to terms emotionally with it, like um, supportives do, but because it's gonna make sense. Like they they have to you know create this 
logical track record why it's the right thing to do. And when you um the uh, the thing the thing about it, Carlos, is uh, is that when you uh, when you understand how to talk to um, each of these individual uh, you know, behaviors, and you can present your case in the way that you know they're going to understand. Uh, it, it's a lot easier to close. It's a lot easier to build rapport. It's a lot easier to convey uh, the reason why why they should be doing business with you. And it's a lot easier to find out what the real problem is from their mm -hmm. side so you can come in and solve it. Um, usually conversations with high drivers, appoint, those appointments, I mean, in and out, 15, 20 minutes and, and walk, walk in, have that conversation, walk out with a contract 15 minutes later. Uh, an appointment with somebody who's a high S or a high C um, those appointments are, I mean, you're talking two and a half hours, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, just because of the, um, the, uh, the style of communication that takes place. So mm -hmm. if, if I were to tell you like, what's the number one thing? Yeah. We all learn scripts, rebuttals and, and phrases and, and transitions and everything. But one thing that really makes a big, big difference is understanding how people communicate. Um, it, it's like the best piece of advice that, that I can give anybody out there who's, who's looking to become a closer. Mm -hmm. That's the core of it. The, the psychology is understanding how people, how yourself yeah. operates, which I think is the, the ultimate 80, 20 lever is understanding yourself, your subconscious programming, but then understanding in other people, I guess for a quick, a quick wrap real quick, uh, an appointment with a D might just be a, a quick handshake, show them what they would net doing a deal with you versus maybe potentially listing it with a realtor and the, the um, operating costs. If the house is listed on the market for six months, and I, you might have to just really build rapport, be friendly, show that. Uh, think, and then that <clears throat> with high eyes, think experiences. Um, it's um, highlight the experience of what can happen if they go through the process. Like find out the, find out what the real problem is. And this is this is exactly how I approach. And you're right about the high D's. It's, it's bottom line driven. Okay. Um, high eyes. It, it's okay. Uh, you've been, for example, the first one I can think of right now. It's a gentleman. He was a very high eye. Um, he really really wanted to sell and then go on this um, just buy a um, an RV and then travel throughout the United States. That was his thing. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't, he was a, his secondary was a high S. So he was an IS. He was very people oriented, not necessarily bottom line driven. Um, but it's a, we have a dominant and a secondary, right? Um, we all have, we have all of them, but we have two that usually kind of bubble up to the surface. Mm -hmm. I'm a DI. This gentleman was a, a, an IS. Um, so the, uh, the thing with him was to see, uh, help him see the, uh, the possibilities of the experience. Hey, listen, I, you, you want to sell this, this is what can potentially happen down the line. Um, we were, we got that lead to, via pre foreclosure. Um, uh, so of course, you know, we went down the, uh, the, the whole, you know, uh, road of you're going to save your credit. You're going to do this. We're going to come in, we're closer, all the features and benefits. We said it, you know, we said it, we put it on the table. It was there. Uh, but what made it, uh, um, you know, stick was what really, you know, got him to, to decide to go with us was because we, we helped him see the possibilities of him, um, being able to travel. So it, it's, uh, if we hadn't picked that up, if we didn't know that that was one, one of the things that he was mainly concerned about or the, you know, the big desire that he had, um, we wouldn't have been able to close that. Yeah. But it's experiential with high, high eyes. Love that. Love that. So true. Cause I'm, I'm like one of the highest, uh, eyes is my main thing. I'm ID. So I'm mm -hmm. just the, the inverse of Raphael. So naturally Raph is going to be in general, really, I'll say he's going to be instinctively a, a pretty significant better closer. If you put me and him in like a sales acquisitions role, he's going to be a better closer. I'm going to kind of care more about like how my relationship with somebody is going to be long term and feelings and and every everything like that. Um, so it's interesting. Me and him are kind of flip flop there. So for the importance yeah. of DI. S is going to be someone that you're probably going to have to talk about what's going to happen with the property after you're going to get renters in there, the, you know, you're going to help the neighborhood get better. And then C yeah, is yeah. probably or go with that, with the S any breakdown on that. Yeah. So S is uh, it's um, they like to, I mean, there, there's going to be an emotional attachment to the property. Um, and, and it's, it, again, it's not deceit, right? It's just helping them 
see what what matters to them. Uh, for example, for a high S, uh, if you come in, if you tell them or if you show them how that property, you know, after the flip, after this, after that, it's gonna, you know, can help a a, a family that's starting out. You know, for example, oh, we're gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna, you know, increase the value of the neighborhood because we're gonna flip it to tip top shape. So the value of your neighbors, it's actually gonna go up as well. I mean, they're gonna be, you know, they're gonna be taken care of and that sort of thing. Um, one thing that uh, this and this is actually a very very common scenario. A lot of a lot of high S's don't want to have the conversations with their tenants that they need to vacate the property. They don't want to have the conversations with their family. Like a high S's are usually the people who will allow their family members to squat on the property for ten years without getting paid. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've seen that before because we've seen it a thousand times. Um, and um, and it, it's the, the reason behind it is it's going to be that difficult conversation that they need to have. So, I mean, it's one problem that we can come in and solve for them. Hey, listen, we'll handle the conversation. We'll be, you know, we'll, we'll whatever we need to do on our end to handle that, we'll, we will do it. We'll make sure that you don't have to put yourself through that emotional strain uh, because that's really what they're, you know, afraid of. They, mm -hmm. it's, it's that conversation. So, yeah. 100%. And then the C, what, what is the C like? You're essentially showing maybe like what an entire HUD statement would look like defining, you know, every part of the contract and what an assignment is, everything like that. With high C's, they're usually going to ask you um, for a little bit of time to make up their mind. Um, they high C's are actually the only the only uh, uh, type of people that we will leave a contract behind because they do want to go through the clauses. Um, and, and they want to make sure that they have, you know, everything, all the, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted and everything. They just need their time to process the information. Um, and yeah, for them, I mean, well, you got to run comps. You got, you got to run property analysis anytime you go on an appointment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, more than likely, you're going to have the same comps. You're going to have the same stuff. Um, and this is how you're going to present it to a high D. Hey, listen, man, I have all the comps right here. This is what it's showing me. Um, and then they're going to be, okay, cool. They're going to take it. They're going to look at it maybe glance, uh, you know, through, through two or three of the sheets that you have on there. Uh, and then they'll put it aside. A high C is going to take those and it's, you know, they're going to look at the beds, the baths. They're going to look at, you know, the condition of the house. They're going to look, so they're going to break all the data down. They're going to be very meticulous about the actual information or, and everything that you're providing. If you provide something that smells like bullshit to them, and I'm, I don't know if I can, you know, be oh, <laughs> <whatever>. <laughs> Lingu linguistic, linguistically <laughs> improper here. But uh, if you feed them some BS, they're going to pick it, you know, pick it right up. And then you're going to lose any possibility to report with them. Um, so, yeah, it, it's just, you know, for them, you are going to have to sit there a little longer and then explain, give them the logical reason why this makes sense. OK, um, that's that's a breakdown for them. Got it. Perfect, guys. So we have an idea. You know, this is very foundational. The four different types on the disk analysis, how to work with that. I guess I want to ask a little bit about pre-qualifying. We're going to talk into personality. And then like when or not to go on an appointment for somebody that's listening to this going on physical. And I know there's a bunch of variables that go into that, how many leads you're getting per week, what type of person you're, you're you know, what type of staff I guess you have. But speaking to that a little bit, just because so many people are virtual now, what would, say, what would you say your best advice is here towards the end of 2021? And then we can hop into 2022 plans here. So 2021, you said uh, best advice for going on appointments or not going, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I guess kind of just your your best insight on pre-qualification, understanding oh, okay. motivation, you know, whether either setting up a phone appointment if somebody's virtual or actually spending the time and resources to go see that person, um, you know, if you can't read the body language and stuff over a phone. Got it. Yeah, and the, I mean, and, and the crazy thing, man, is that, uh, you know, 70% of the, of the communication happens through, through body language. Um, we have a small amount that actually happens that's genuine communication that happens from the stuff that's actually being said. Uh, the rest of it comes from uh, from tonality. So we we still have access to about you know twenty five percent of of you know reading between the lines when we talk to somebody on the phone. Um, again, if you're on the phone, you're looking to a high or you're speaking to a high D. The tonality is going to be higher. It's going to be dynamic. Uh, same thing for a high I. Um, and then. Um, when you're looking or when you're talking to a high S, it's going to be more monotone, more, more controlled. And, and same thing for somebody analytical, right? It's just the um, um, people who are high S's, they're people oriented. 
um, high C's, they're both monotoned. They're both controlled conversations, but high C's are more logic oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, high D's are bottom line. So they're talking about results when high I's are talking about the sister, the aunt, the uncle, and they're people oriented. So that's how you kind of, you know, uh, separate each one of those when you're talking with them on the phone. That's how you can, you know, um, have a pretty good, decent idea, uh, you know, fairly quick, what type of person you're talking to. Now, with that being said, we have um, the way that we work the leads, we 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 source the leads, we have cold callers, we have PPC and all that stuff. Everything goes into a lead manager uh, database and we have a lead manager that goes in Then they just, uh, my acquisitions people never talk to somebody who's not pre-qualified. Um, so we have sourcing, that's just gauging for interest. Uh, they send them into our CRM and inside the CRM, they'll get pre-qualified by the lead manager. The lead manager is looking for the, uh, the timeline, the condition, the motivation, and then the price. Um, so we have four pillars. I mean, it, it's not, at this point, it's something fairly common because there, there's, a, uh, I mean, we all talk about, you know, the, the pillars of, of pre-qualification, right? Uh, but you are going to find out the condition of the house, uh, whether or not it's, you know, it, it's in distress and whatnot. That's not going to be the uh, end all be all. It's just a, another red flag of whether or not they can move on to acquisitions, right? A lot of people have great houses, but they're behind on payments. Um, they, you know, the situation is going to be different. So, uh, ask about the condition pre-qualify base, uh, you know, based on that. And that's one of the four pillars. Um, the next time or the next uh, thing is going to be the timeline. So ask him, how soon do you need to close? How, or when can we come in and close this property? Uh, you know, as you're pre-qualifying, if they say within 30 days, it's a hot, you know, they need to move quick. Uh, mm -hmm. if they get, if they say three months, you know, 120 days or whatever, like there's more time, right? That lead is not pre-qualified yet. They're not ready to pull the trigger. So we don't send somebody who's, who says, uh, you know, 90 days to acquisitions. Mm -hmm. We, we keep them in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the oven per se. Right. The next thing is going to be the, um, motivation. There's different levels of motivation. Um, and, uh, and the motivation can be situational. Um, it can be, you know, for example, uh, they're going through a divorce. They're, they're relocating. I mean, the motiv motivations are going to be different. Um, it's going to be, you're also going to have financial factors that go into the motivation, but it's not always about the money. Like that's one, um, one thing that I, that I, when I was, when I was, when I first got into this, I thought everything was about the cash. I thought I had to, you know, give them the highest offers because that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, like that, that's it's not how they're thinking. I was thinking, you know, from with my glasses on. I was thinking with my problems, not looking at their problems. So, like, I learned not to go into any seller appointment assuming with any assumptions whatsoever. When I go and show up to a seller's door, I really don't know what's going on. I don't know. That's it. I'm not going to assume that the house is beat up and they need cash because they can be super wealthy and then just not give a crap about the condition of the house. I've seen that. So learning not to assume is the biggest thing that's helped me diagnose the, the, uh, the motivation. Um, because as you're going through a discovery process and asking them questions and finding out about what the real situation is, why they want to sell, uh, you come up you know, with, with different things. So there's going to be um, uh, people are going to sell, uh, are going to want to sell because they're getting divorced, because they're getting relocated, because, um, you know, they got tired. They have a squatter in, in the house and, you know, family members that are fighting with. I mean, you, you name it, man, the, the motivations are going to be out there. And then the fourth one is going to be the, the price. Right. Um, we give them a range. If they're really pressing for for a number, my uh, my lead manager does not negotiate deals. Um, but she can give them a range. So we'll give them a range between 70 and 85% uh, if they're pushing for it. Now, if they have three out of those four pillars, like it's something that my acquisitions person can come in and then just take the rest of the way home. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's a pre-qualification for us. But we, uh, three out of four sends over to acquisitions and then acquisitions does their thing. That's how we work uh, the, um, the, the flow of the leads as they're coming in. Very cool. <clears throat> Well, man, this has been an awesome interview. I want to ask real quick before talking 2022 and any best insight you may have in addition to what we discussed today. Um, what are kind of the resources that someone else could use besides getting a psychology degree or multiple psychology degrees for learning? I know on this on this show, I've definitely mentioned pitch anything and never split the difference, which is, is some NLP, but you know, just general sales type stuff. Do you have any any resources, recommendations in addition to that? 
Um, yeah, I think, uh, and well, I like to stick to, not stick to, but I like to, um, to highlight the, um, the acquisitions. I, I'm an acquisitions guy, that, like that's my backbone, right? Uh, but one thing that helped me out was self-perception. Uh, um, you, it, to be a good acquisitions, to be a good closer, you have to feel like you're a good closer. It starts with that. And if you haven't closed anything, it can be, you know, somewhat of a hard thing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to see yourself as a good closer. And, and there's like there's a methodical process of doing that. One book that really helped me early on was Psycho Cybernetics. Um, and uh, is it is that love it? Yeah, Classic. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Psycho Cybernetics is a really good book on, on uh, self-image, self-perception and, and increasing that level of belief. Like it all mm -hmm. starts with you. Um, you can go to all the masterminds. You can go to all the trainings. You can go to all the seminars um, and, and never take action. Usually the action lacks because of a, a, a lack in self-belief. OK, so you have to believe in yourself, at least have a degree of faith that keeps that's going to you know, start growing and growing and growing as you get better, as you get your first yes, as you get your first appointment, as you get your first signed contract, as you get your first buyer. And then as you get your first uh, paycheck, I can't tell you how many times, man, I see students, um, um, my students just come in and then when they get that, that first paycheck, it's 15, 20 thousand dollars in a lump sum. It's just the the their thought process gets rewired, but it starts with that sense of belief. Um, and I mean, that's, that's really the biggest thing because when you have that, man, it, it's everything else just kind of falls into place. You're going to learn the strategies, right? You're going to learn the scripts. You're going to learn the process. It, you know, you're going to learn the blueprints per se to, to do anything, but it starts with you at a, at a mindset level. 100%, man. Couldn't agree more. And Psycho Cybernetics, I talk about a lot. It's a very foundational book for yeah. a lot of mindset and self image psychology stuff that has been released since then. But it's so, so true as yeah. far as just kind of like how you see yourself and how you feel and behave kind of goes on autopilot with how you want, how you want to program yourself. So I always talk about that's the biggest leverage point that you can work on. And then obviously listening to mechanical operational stuff like Raphael. Um, what does it look like? working with you as well. I do have reiwholesaling.com for Rafael's Wholesaling and Blueprint. What does it look like working for with you and who is kind of like your ideal um, student to bring on? Um, ideal student is anybody doing less than five deals um, a month. It's uh, if you're, if you're in that stage, right. Where you're getting, you know, trying to understand how lead management works, how to actually find the sellers. And, and at that stage, I mean, it's uh, the wholesale business blueprint. It's really a, a process. That's what it does. I'm, I'm very linear uh, when it comes to building systems out. And, and uh, I understood early on that the information can be out there, but the order of things is going to be, you mm -hmm. know, going to be subjective, right. To depending on who's looking at it. Um, and what I did, I just laid out, I mean, my, basically my own my business model on a step-by-step -step, um you know one foot in front of the other type of basis so mm -hmm. um yeah the, the wholesome business blueprint is uh, it's what i have out there and we tackle everything man we tackle everything from mindset to actual operations and and you in, inevitably you know people get to a point where they want to scale and then we you know we'll break into that sort of stuff as well um but uh, it's it's always important, man, to just have a a good foundation uh, laid out before you start drop you know throwing chaos on it. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent, man. Could not agree more. Very quality guy. Always awesome to to chat with him. To end things here, man. What does an ideal twenty twenty two look like for if you're doing the thirty minute visualizations from Psycho Cybernetics? What does twenty twenty two look like for for you? Um, 2022, uh, well, by then, uh, it's stuff that I have in the, in the oven right now. Um, it, I'm building up the, uh, uh, software for a CRM standalone software. So that should be out by then. Um, the wholesome business and, um, and the fix and flip business. I mean, we're, we're ramping up, we're ramping that up. We're ramping up the brokerage as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's in a nutshell, that's, the stuff that I'm focused on, on, on breaking into the, the first two quarters of the year. I have a couple of other things laid out for this, for the last two quarters of the year. 
but yeah, I mean, kicking it off, right. It's going to be that. <laughs> Love it, man. Love it, man. Might have your son locking up some more deals for you as well there, which is cool to see. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, man. Well, awesome. And what's the best place to follow you, Rafael? Um, I'm pretty active on social media. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Rafael Cortez, CEO. Uh, you can go to my website, rafaelcortez.net. Uh, um, or check out the wholesale business blueprint at rei wholesaling.com. Uh, awesome, yeah. man. Well, this has been a fun, informative. You guys know I'm going to love it because we talk psychology and mindset a lot of the times, but make sure to give Raphael a follow. And then if you are in that range that he mentioned, highly suggest his coaching if you want to work with a quality person that has a ton of experience and a lot of knowledge. So thanks for checking out this episode, guys, and catch you soon. Appreciate the invite, brother. It's been fun. Yeah, brother.